continue reading Machiavellian Machiavellian book, uh, The Prince. And during my last read, I couldn't understand anything. But later on, I did some uh, brief research and found that my last read, the, the passage, the passage I, I last read, is so remarkably sensational. Uh, basically, during my last read, um, during my last read, uh, Machiavelli first talked about how smart the Romans were in keeping that, uh, uh, in keeping the surrounding countries, surrounding regions, uh, in keeping them as uh, as its own allies. Right, and therefore it is very safe. It was very safe for the Romans. However, Machiavelli pointed out a, a contrasting example, uh, which is uh, France. Uh, the, the French king Louis XII uh, did a lot of folly, committed a lot of folly. First of all, uh, the Louis king, um, the Louis king. Of course, the Louis King, uh, twelfth king, he conquered Lombardy and shared it with the uh, Venetians. But as a result, he also conquered a lot of sub regions around Italy. And and um, the problem happened when this uh, Louis twelfth, he, I don't know what did he do. He grew the power of Pope Alexander, the church leader, and also he also shared. Naples a region with uh, the Kingdom of Spain and as a result this seemed to be causing a lot of problems to Louis XII because first, because first of all uh, first of all the Venetians got angry because uh, the Venetians maybe felt jealous why does why does this uh, Louis XII become so powerful suddenly and also of course the Venetians couldn't stand uh, the extra power Louis XII uh, gave 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 Alexander Pope yeah so as a result Louis XII was in deep trouble he was he was beleaguered by a lot of enemy due to his own conduct so that was very sensational I'll continue reading right now and if another should allege the pledge which the king had given to the Pope that he would assist him in the enterprise. In exchange for the dissolution of his marriage and for the cap to ruin. To that I reply that what I shall write later on concerning the faith of princes, how it ought to be kept. Thus, King Louis lost. Thus, King Louis lost Lombardy by not having followed any of the con conditions observed by those who have taken possession possession of countries and wish to retain them. Now, is there any miracle in this? But much that is reasonable and quite natural. And on these matters, I spoke at Nantes with Rouen when Valentino as. Cesare Borgia, the son of Pope Alexander, was usually called, occupied the Romagna, and on Cardinal Ruin, observing to me that the Italians did not understand war, I replied to him that the French did not understand statecraft, meaning that otherwise they would not have allowed the church to reach such greatness. And in fact, it has been seen that the greatness of the Church and of Spain in Italy has been caused by France, and her ruin may be attributed to them. From this, a general rule is drawn which never of rarely fails, that he who is the cause of another becoming powerful is ruined, because that predominant predominancy has been brought about either by astuteness or else by force and both and both are distrusted by him who has been raised to power chapter 4
why the kingdom of Darius, conquered by Alexander, did not rebel against the successors of Alexander at his death. Considering the difficulties which men have had to hold to a newly acquired state, some might wonder how, seeing that Alexander the Great became the master of Asia in a few years and died whilst it was scarcely settled, whence it might appear reasonable that the whole empire would have rebelled. Nevertheless, his successors maintained themselves and had to meet no other difficulty than that which arose among themselves from their own ambitions. I answer that the principalities of which one has, has record are found to be governed in two different ways, either by a prince with a body of servants who assist him to govern the kingdom as ministers by his favour and permission, or by a prince and barons who hold that dignity who hold that dignity by antiquity of blood and not by the grace of the prince. Such barons have states and their own subjects who recognize them as lords and hold them in natural affection. Those states that are governed by a prince and his servants hold that prince in more consideration because in all the country there is no one who is recognized as superior to him. And if they yield obedience to another, they do it as to a minister and official. And they do not bear him any particular affection. The examples of these two governments in our time are the Turk and the King of France. The entire monarchy of the Turk is governed by one lord. The others are his servants and dividing his kingdom into Sanjaks. He sends their different administrators and shifts and changes them as he chooses. But the King of France is placed in the midst of an ancient body of lords, acknowledged by their own subjects and beloved by them. They have their own prerogatives, nor can the king take these away except at his peril. Therefore, he who considers both of these states will recognize great difficulties in seizing the state of the Turk, but once it is conquered, great ease in holding it. The causes of the difficulties in seizing the kingdom of the Turk are that the usurper cannot be called in by the princes of the kingdom. Nor can he, can he hope to be assisted in his designs by the revolt of those whom the Lord has around him. This arises from the reasons given above, for his ministers, being all slaves and born men, can only be corrupted with great difficulty, and one can expect little advantage from them when they have been corrupted. As they cannot carry the people with them for reason, the reasons assigned. Hence, he who attacks the Turk must bear in mind that he will find him united, and he will have to rely more on his own strength than on the revolt of others. But if once the Turk has been conquered and routed in the field in such a way that he cannot replace his armies, there is nothing to fear but the family of this prince, and this being exterminated, there remains no one to fear, the others having no credit with the people. And as the conqueror did not rely on them before his victory, so he ought not to fear them after it. The contrary happens in kingdoms governed like that of France because one can easily enter there by gaining over some baron of a kingdom, for one always finds malcontents and such as desire a change. Such men, for the reasons given, can open the way into the state and render the victory easy. But if you wish to hold it afterwards, you meet with infinite difficulties. both from those who have assisted you and from those you have crushed. Nor is it enough for you to have exterminated the family of the prince because the lords that remain make themselves the heads of fresh movements against you. As 
And as you are unable to unable either to satisfy or exterminate them, that state is lost whenever time brings the opportunity. Now, if you will consider what was the nature of the government of Darius, you will find similar to the kingdom of the Turk, and therefore it was only necessary for Alexander first to overthrow him in the field and then to take the country from him, after which victory, Darius being killed, the state remained secure to Alexander for the above reasons, and if his successors had been united, they would have enjoyed it securely and at the east, for there were no tumults raised in the kingdom except those they provoked themselves. But it is impossible to hold with such tranquility states constituted, constituted like that of France. Hence arose those frequent rebellions against the Romans in Spain, France and Greece owing to the many principalities there were in these states. Of which as long as the memory of them endured, the Romans always held an insecure possession. But with the power and long continuance of the empire, the memory of them passed away, and the Romans then became secure possessors. And when fighting afterwards amongst themselves, each one was able to attach to himself his own parts of the country, according to the authority he had assumed there. And the family of the former lord being exterminated, none other than the Romans were acknowledged. When these things are remembered, no one will marvel at the ease with which Alexander held the empire of Asia, or at the difficulties which, other has, which others have had to keep an acquisition, such as Pyrrhus and many more. This is not occasioned by the little abundance of ability in the conqueror, but by the want of uniformity in the subject state. Chapter 5. Concerning the way to govern cities or principalities which lived under their own laws before they were annexed. Whenever those states which have been acquired as stated have been accustomed to live under their own laws and in freedom, there are three causes for those who wish to hold them. First, the first is to ruin them, the next is to reside there in person, the third is to permit them to live under their own laws, drawing a tribute and establishing within it an oligarchy, which will keep it friendly to you. Because such a government, being created by the prince, knows that it cannot stand without his friendship and, in and interest, and does it utmost to support him. And therefore, he, would, he who would keep a city accustomed to freedom will hold it more easily by the means of its own citizens than in any other way. There are, for example, the Spartans and the Romans. The Spartans held Athens and Thebes, Thebes, establishing there an oligarchy. Nevertheless, they lost them. The Romans, in order to hold Capua, Carthage, and Numantia, dismantled them and did not lose them. They wished to hold Greece as the Spartans, Spartans held it, making it free and permitting it its laws and did not succeed. So to hold it, they were compelled to dismantle many cities in the country. For in truth, there is no safe way to retain them otherwise than by ruining them. And he who becomes master of a city accustomed to freedom and does not destroy it, I'll stop it and continue in another episode. See you. Goodbye.